for this session uh, panel discussion that starts at 4:45 we have uh, several panelists uh, who are um, thought leaders if i could say so um in different aspects around mental health um we have laura murphy from international association for premenstrual disorders who's actually joining us from uk today um uh, laura is the director of education and awareness at imp uh, iampd uh, we also have a uh, professor amita danda who is a professor at nalsar university in hyderabad um we have dr bhargavi dawar who is a noted mental health activist researcher and managing trustee of the bapu trust in pune and we have shweta shrinivasan uh, who is a practicing therapist and the co-founder of the mindclan.com thank you so much uh, for joining us today uh, everybody on the panel uh, laura if you can go first and uh, tell us um, about um, the the in the work that you do and also about uh, your organization yeah sure so hi thank you so much for having me can you hear me okay yes before i start talking great okay so um my name's laura murphy i'm joining you from um the uk about half an hour out of london um i work for the international association for premenstrual disorders so we work with people um who live with pmdd and or PME so um, <clears throat> I'll briefly explain what they are because often people have never heard of them so uh, PMDD is essentially a very severe form of PMS so it's a mental health disorder that only affects people in the luteal phase of their menstrual cycle so um, between ovulation and around the time of their periods they um, suffer from um, symptoms such as depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, fatigue, um, joint pain, um, panic attacks, um, dissociation, um, so forth. There's a, there's a big list. And also then there's PME, so that is the premenstrual exacerbation of um, an existing, well, we it's any disorder, but we focus specifically on any exacerbation of a psychiatric disorder. So perhaps someone who had um, generalised anxiety disorder would have it flare in the luteal phase of their, their cycle. So that would be PME. Um, I suffered with PMDD for a long time undiagnosed and I now work for IAPND helping to spread awareness and also um, building their educational um, tools within the organisation. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh Professor Danda, if you could go next and just speak a few words about uh, your work. I came into the whole area of mental health by doing my uh, doctorate in the area of how law looks at the issue of mental illness. Um, and when I started out, I just felt it was, you know, like all other disciplines, especially the, psych the disciplines of psychology and psychiatry and, you know, like had more to more to say on these issues than law had. But as I went around working forward, I realized that in some manner, how effective these other disciplines can or cannot be uh, gets determined by the law. Also, I started by believing that mental health questions in law uh, occur in very designated kind of areas like care and treatment and defense of insanity. And then started to find that the whole issue of legal personhood or personality kind of crops up in every area of law. So some of the most critical mental health questions actually occur everywhere. And I have been since then trying to draw these connections and trying to say that mental health issues are not some marginalized, excluded, exceptional issues. They actually occur everywhere. In law. Uh, some of this I have been weaving into both my research and my teaching. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Dr. Bhargavi, if you could go next. My name is Bhargavi Dawar. Um, I identify as a childhood survivor of psychiatric institutions in India. Spent many years of my childhood days being exposed to terrible agonies of uh, these uh, post-colonial institutions. Been a lifelong critic of uh, psychiatry and uh, continue to uh, think of alternatives to this discipline. Um, my PhD and most of my early writings was on critiquing psychiatry, uh, whether it's a science, you know, whether it qualifies uh, 
uh, as a science like say physics, chemistry uh, or biology, which has solid um, um, biological markers for the finding of a disease, unlike psychiatry. Um, later on, I kind of gave up on the critiques. I don't do so much critique anymore, but started to work on reconstruction, finding new ways of healing because I went through severe depression. I, I still have long-term trauma. Uh, it lasted many decades. Um, so I've been looking at uh, you know, the capacity of the body to heal itself. So I became an arts-based therapist. I established a program through the Bapu Trust called uh, Sahar. Um, we do lots and lots of work uh, building social capital of communities, you know, connecting people with development resources. We address a lot of social justice and general well-being issues. Um, and I believe so that is enough. Um, so I've uh, been writing in the area of gender and mental health since very long. Work also in the disability sector and uh, with respect to the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So we also have an Asia-Pacific Forum, which is membership-based. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I really enjoyed the video this morning and the work that Belong has been doing, especially with young people. So look forward to more connections. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhargavi. Um, Shweta? Yes. Hi. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Go for it. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Shweta Srinivasan. I uh, am a practicing therapist and a lot of my um, work in the therapeutic uh, space is informed by narrative ideas and narrative practices. Uh, I've been practicing for about four or five years. And in addition to that, I also co-run an online mental health platform called themindclan.com. And uh, on themindclan.com, we hope to uh, sort of offer a curated list of mental health services and tools, such as therapists, workshops, support groups, blog articles, helplines, and other resources. And our hope with the MindClan is really to sort of um, restore agency back to the users of mental health services, uh, especially because we notice a lot of a funnel-based, cookie-cutter-like approach that exists in some of the dominant mental health care systems where people aren't really given uh, their agency or choice to uh, figure out the kind of mental health care that fits with them and fits with their lived experience. So some of what we're doing with the Mind Clan is to uh, create choice uh, by providing as much information and as many resources as possible, and also to sort of amplify some of the work that many communities are also currently doing and meeting some of the unique mental health needs of those communities already. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Prita. Thank you so much, everybody, for uh, giving us uh, information and telling us about what uh, what your work has been like. Uh, we are really happy to have you on this panel today. Um, uh, just quickly go to the first question that we have, uh, which is for Shweta. And it is uh, the most basic question that uh, we should be asking is, uh, Shweta, what is the real purpose of mental health care? If you can uh, start by telling us that. Absolutely. Uh, so I know that a lot of today has been focused already on what the purpose of mental health care should not be and uh, some of the challenges that the current mental health care system faces in terms of not meeting some of the unique needs of marginalized communities. But I do want to sort of reiterate some of those points very quickly. Uh, because I think in order to reimagine what the purpose of mental health care uh, can be, I think it's so important to question some of the existing uh, narratives around it. And a lot of the existing narratives talk about terms like recovery or how mental health care is going to help you live a self-actualized life or be more productive, be more efficient. Uh, almost creating this picture of what a mentally healthy person looks like. And uh, a lot of these definitions are rooted in uh, ableism and capitalism, normativity, very typical understandings, right? And it's important to question um, whose experiences are privileged by this definition and whose experiences are marginalized. And does health look the same for everybody? Uh, it doesn't. So I think when if mental health is sort of helping a person adjust in society or fit well in society, I think in turn, what it's doing is um, harming the person because it's helping them adjust to oppression in some way and helping them ad adjust to these normative sanctioned ways of, uh, you know, being. So I don't really think that the purpose of mental health care should be correctional in nature, where parts of your identity 
uh, are being you know forced to be changed in order for you to like i mentioned adjust to oppression like i'm thinking about one of the young people i think who was experiencing um slut shaming uh, at their school in one of the videos you showed earlier uh, in the day and how that was such a such an important example of how their identity as a woman was being sexualized and she was being told to uh, not wear certain clothes or look a certain way so that you know she can adjust to that environment and uh that shouldn't really be the purpose of mental health care in my opinion so uh so i think in order for us to reimagine the purpose i think three things sort of come to mind one is that uh what is the mental health care system conceptualizing as the problem that needs addressing um whether the problem is like everyone has mentioned so far you know if it's viewed as something internal uh or whether you can sort of understand how that problem is situated in contexts and in systems that are unjust and i feel like that conceptualization of the problem needs to change from internal to more systemic um secondly i think uh again taking from some of the earlier points listening into the wisdom and the lived experience of communities um who are in the margins and listening into what are some of their unique experiences and their needs so that the mental health care system can uh, change in ways to address those needs uh, instead of you know taking on the expert position of uh, knowing what is it that they need so i think listening in and really sort of drawing in from that community wisdom becomes um, secondly important and lastly i'd say that uh, i think mental health care in general uh, gets limited to therapy uh many times which again isn't really helpful because at the end of the day mental health care is meant to be a space that is affirming of um you know your preferred ways of being of coping of living and that can look like therapy but it can also look like support groups and it can also look like i think i remember shivangi mentioning in the first panel about alternative methods of healing like uh, you know dance or movement or music um you know or friends even so even like acknowledging how uh, affirming mental health spaces and practices exist in every day lives uh, is something that i think is important to acknowledge and a lot of such work is already happening like i think i do want to acknowledge that we are i think moving in that space of course it a lot more needs to be done but uh, i think with the mind clan that's one of our hopes even the blue dawn is doing some tremendous work with uh, the intersection of caste and mental health uh, narrative practices really sort of pushes some of these ideas forward so i think um, yeah these are some of my thoughts thank you so much for actually bringing those points forward and also summarizing uh, some of the discussions we've had this morning and then maybe making the logical progression to speak about whatever you spoke about uh, that actually brings us to the next question which has been something that we have discussed before in the in the sessions uh, that happened in the afternoon and would also like uh, to get your perspective on it um, uh, to understand how the role of diagnosis and therapy um, is it a limiting factor and how far is it an impediment to go forward so i think if we're talking about diagnosis i uh think it's imperative that we acknowledge the almost historical oppression that comes with the dsm which is basically the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders for any of us who may not be aware uh it was it's it's a document created by the american psychiatric association back in the 1950s uh and i think i just want to take a minute to acknowledge that uh you know a, a lot of that process uh, in itself has not been inclusive enough um and uh i think it's important as practitioners for us to even uh, be be more aware of what that process of coming into the dsm was like um the fact that its underlying uh, approach has been to in a way scientifically classify human experiences into normal abnormal acceptable unacceptable based on some arbitrary criteria um and historically the dsm and diagnostic uh you know labels uh they have been created for the purpose of mental health professionals to have more ease in communication with each other uh and to also eventually you know find what they call more evidence based approaches and methods to respond to some of these concerns that people are going through uh and the reason i'm i'm bringing this up is because i think it's important to know that 
historically the dsm or the diagnostic labels have centered the professional's knowledge and the professional's expertise as opposed to the lived experience as much uh, or people's experience of what that distress is like so um, so i'd say that in the process of therapy uh, there are two things about the diagnostic labels that i've noticed one is that um, for a lot of people it becomes a limiting factor because it's often the first and the only piece of information that a mental health professional engages with when it comes to sort of interacting with the client so that becomes almost like the only purpose of the therapeutic approach that everything is basically surrounding how to manage this disorder or illness and what needs to be done to uh, you know treat it or reduce its influence on the person so i think that way it becomes limiting because it in a way eclipses so much of uh, what the person also is and their identity and their context uh, but having said that i have also worked with a lot of people uh, and heard experiences of people who have felt liberated um, and felt that a diagnostic label is able to um help them make sense of their experience and make sense of their distress um in fact just the other day a very dear friend of mine uh, who is also a therapist was telling me about how her work with a young person uh, uh, was uh, i mean a, a lot of her conversations with that person was about how the diagnosis of autism was something that really helped that person make sense of their experience so i do want to acknowledge that that also occurs so if this is what the situation is right now i feel like in my practice there are two things that help me engage with diagnosis um in a way that i can maybe hope to make it more inclusive uh one is tentativeness and one is collaboration by tentativeness i mean that i approach this information of a diagnosis with the sense that this is not the absolute truth about this person and this is just one piece of information that i need to consider amongst so much more um that this person is going to bring into these conversations right and uh, by collaboration i mean that i think when a diagnosis comes into the picture it's very possible for us as practitioners to invite the client to talk about that diagnosis in the sense of what do they feel about it like do they feel like it's fitting with their experience um are there parts of that diagnostic label that uh, you know they agree with are there parts of it that they don't agree with and really sort of in, uh, making that conversation possible with the client to uh, you know renegotiate what this diagnosis means in their life and i think essentially what that would do uh, i'm hoping is that we move away from this dominant understanding of a you know internalized deficit based uh you know uh, something being wrong with me failure inside of me sort of an understanding of diagnosis to a more um uh i would say nuanced understanding of the diagnosis that centers the person's lived experience and the person's knowledge of you know what fits with them the most thank you so much for that shweta um it, that was very uh, that was very helpful uh, and uh, that was a very great like very insightful explanation of how diagnosis should be looked at um and i'm i'm glad we spoke about diagnosis because uh, my next question is for laura here uh, who's actually working with conditions such as pmdd that are hardly ever diagnosed right how does one look at that is um, something uh, so important for us to talk about today because uh, while there are mental health conditions like shweta pointed out that are mentioned in the manual and uh, that's where um, practitioners are picking it up from there are also um, so many challenges uh, to the uh, challenges that one faces because of identity or some so many conditions that um, very very few people might be experiencing and maybe uh, maybe not enough conversation is happening around this for instance we did have a conversation around menstrual health and mental health uh, earlier in may where um, one of the panelists sonal from who's the co-founder of boont cups pointed out that uh, you know diagnosing something like this is so difficult because uh, for instance uh, mental health issues or menstrual health and mental health issues that women face are so often not diagnosed because uh, more often than not all your sample body types are that of a uh, that of a male so there is there is so much gap here with respect to just diagnosis itself right so um my question to laura would be since she's somebody who's working at this 
um, at this intersection or at this uh, at with this uh, kind of um, uh, topics. So, Laura, this is for you. How does one identify mental health disorders that are closely linked to certain people or communities, and in that respect, uh, bring conversations on uh, menstrual health uh, disorders such as PMDD, PME, and PMS as mental health challenges to the mainstream? The question would be, when are we going to break away from understanding, say, mental health challenges that a certain community faces or a certain section of individuals face um, as a problem that they have? And when will we move on to understanding it in a more holistic perspective? And when is, how does it uh, work out? Like, how does that mental health diagnosis work? So many questions. <laughs> you can take your time. So, yeah, it's... Okay, I'll, I'll start with the first one. So, so many people um, are, I mean, PMDD is a disorder that's very underdiagnosed. It was entered into the DSM-5 in 2013. Um, I think historically, women's health issues have not been taken seriously. And I think we still see that so much um, now within the PMDD community that um, people are written off as hysterical, um, being difficult, that it's a personality flaw, um, you know, so forth, so forth, when it does actually have a biological cause. So I think just going back to what Shweta said, I know personally I sobbed when I got a diagnosis because it meant for me that after all those years of suffering, I had a professional the first time in 17 years sit down in front of me and say, this is clearly what you have and you're a classic example and it just felt like the weight had been lifted from my shoulders you know I wasn't a broken awful person it wasn't weakness if anything you know it takes amazing resilience to get through PMDD because it's a condition unless well managed or treated that comes back month after month after month and it's relentless and it's exhausting and Again, it took me back to what Shreta was saying, you know, about keywords like recovery, which work really well in things, well, potentially work well when you are dealing with depression. I've suffered with depression myself and you are on that um, upward sort of curve to getting better and getting recovered and back to normal and back to your normal life, whatever that may be. Whereas... Um, with PMDD that can be incredibly difficult because it's so cyclical um, for some people you know two weeks a month are taken out with these horrible symptoms and mainly psychiatric but um, often physical as well um, hypersomnia is one thing I suffered from having to sleep 18 hours a day joint pain um, and so forth bloating um, it, it, it is incredibly difficult and I think the way it's going to start getting dug. Oh, yeah, I shall pop something. Someone just asked about PMDD. I shall pop that in the thing. Um, I, I think the way we're going to start getting it diagnosed is a few factors. So um, I know there's some great work going on out in India as well as in the UK about uh, talking about menstrual health talking about menstrual education, talking more openly about periods, the cycle. Um, and I think there's a real, it's been happening for years, but I think with things like social media and TikTok and Instagram, people are just so much more open about um, disorders. And, you know, they're talking about things like clots and heavy bleeding and you know just taking that shame away from it taking that stigma away from it it's something that's very very normal it's something so many people go through you know but historically you know it's PMDD kind of straddles two very healy very historically stigmatized areas so menstrual health and mental health um and uh, so it, it can be very very difficult for, for people to talk about in, in many situations. And I think training is a big issue. We have people going all the way through the mental health system um, here in the, the UK and abroad who have never once been asked by a healthcare professional about their cycle, you know, and that relates to PMDD and PME. PMDD affects one in 20 women and AFAB individuals, you know, that's, you know, 
that's a big deal <laughs> and while it is a, a spectrum disorder um it may affect some people more mildly it still be will still will be life interrupting for it to be a pmd diagnosis it has to your symptoms have to be severe enough to impact um school work personal relationships so it will be having an impact on people um i think um, people who work within mental health have to address the seriousness of hormones and how much it can affect people um, and I think um, there has to be joined up working I think um, as I just said we see people, some people going through the whole way through the mental health system we also people going see people going through the gynae system and being sat opposite a gynecologist who gynae who says um, you know well I'm not a therapist you know, so until there's this joined up holistic kind of working between, um, like you say, collaborative, not a cookie cutter. Um, and whilst the, some of the treatment for PMDD is cycle suppression, so is done by a gynecologist, um, having that joined up networking and support rather than it being one or the other is where people are actually going to feel fully supported and can work through their their journey of pmdd however it may affect them um yeah has that answered everything <laughs> yeah that that's actually uh, thank you so much for actually bringing up the point about collaborative work um with um interdisciplinary uh, interdisciplinary collaborative work is something that you were talking about i think between gynecologists and uh, mental health practitioners uh, for instance uh, in that context i actually have a follow up question laura how do you um, how do we bring in or how do you as an organization how are you already doing this um, since pmdd is not a conversation that's happening in india right but it is very much existent as we learned in our last mm -hmm. session so people don't even know what it means like we know definitions for pms or pcos but we don't know what a pmdd is and we didn't even know it was a psychiatric condition it's, for long time. it's often it's the same in so many countries it's yeah. Yeah. So how, how, how are you creating structures to bring that co uh, conversation into the mainstream or uh, with how did you do that with your organization or how does one somebody who wants to have this conversation or start talking about um these things uh, go forward and it's, i guess it depends very much on your goals if you're talking about a personal level you know we do lots of um patient awareness we work with them um, different organizations who are just out and proud there's um, an awareness organization which I founded, I should take credit for that, called a Vicious Cycle. And they're a group of patients that just make space for it. They talk about it, they share stuff very openly. You know, we've all been in the press, in the media, sharing things on social media, um, very much just putting it out into the, to the space where it's okay to talk about it. And on social media, that is um, just so, so helpful. The finding people on um, Twitter and Instagram and, um, you know, giving people, we call it the light bulb moment, you know, and it's, you know, it's very much not just India, it's not talked about, it's in the UK, in America, Canada, awareness is so very low. And so many people like myself were told, you know, it's just PMS. Um, so many people are misdiagnosed with bipolar. We see that very often where their moods are ups and up and down. They see someone one time, you know, and they're, they're crippled with suicidal thoughts and depression, can't get out of bed. And then they'll see a healthcare professional in two weeks time and they're fine. So it's like bipolar, you know, so then the wrong treatment approach is used, you know, it, it goes on the symptoms sadly you know last for longer and people given treatments they don't necessarily need um it it, de it entirely depends whether it's a personal conversation or or a structural one um in terms of iapnd we're just very out there very open pretty much everyone on the front line um and within the team lives with pmdd or has lived with pmdd and everyone is very open about their symptoms um everyone is very open about their um, experiences we work around people's menstrual cycles um as, a, as an organization it's fantastic you know if you're not feeling if you're in your pmdd you just say that's where i am and you're supported and you know given space um 
Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for uh, mentioning that, Laura, and talking about those things. Uh, a bunch of people have actually uh, asked us what we are actually talking about, which I think is great. Uh, uh, Laura just left a link on the sure. chat. Uh, uh, so anybody who wants to read more about it could actually access that link. Um, and there's also a question that already came in for Laura, which we will actually take in uh, in that question answer session uh, a while uh, a bit later. My next question is actually for Shweta. Um, since we were talking about supportive mental health process, which also Laura stressed upon um, a minute ago. Um, and the question would actually be, we have already spoken a lot about reconstructing power differentials in therapy room. Uh, I would like to bring this question to you on how does, how do you look at reconstructing power differentials in therapy room and how do identity markers of therapists increase these power differentials and going one step further, what is your idea of a supportive mental health care system and can, sub, can, can it really happen on an individual basis or how should it be a group project or how should it be a community oriented approach? Right. So, um, so to address the question on the power differential, uh, yes, it absolutely exists between therapist and client in the sense that uh, I think in general, because of the dominant understanding of, you know, therapists being the expert, uh, they're automatically sort of put on a pedestal of somebody who knows all the answers or will be able to guide the person um, in the right direction. And the person who's seeking therapy is seen as someone in distress, um, and which is why they may not have a sound mind or sound judgment, or may not know how to respond to some of their own concerns. And because of that dominant understanding, there is automatically a power differential. Uh, which I think gets maximized even more because of identity markers, like you mentioned, of, uh, you know, religion, caste, gender, um, uh, I mean, sexuality, uh, all of these identity markers uh, sort of create that power differential even more, uh, you know, purely because of, say, my... Um, uh, identity being of uh, the oppressive community and the the history of that oppression that I come with uh, into that therapy room as well as the client. So we are both carrying those stories uh, and so which is why that power differential does exist. And I think as therapists, as practitioners, I think it's it's so important to firstly even acknowledge that this is a fact and that it exists to recognize it. I think a lot of our earlier conversations were also on how we cannot unsee our identities uh, and it's so important to recognize that uh, each of us comes with multiple identities so if I am seeing a woman in front of me that's not the only thing that I uh, need to sort of limit myself to and there are probably other stories and other identities she's carrying with her um, you know into that therapy room so I think it's important for us to you know acknowledge that uh, recognize that first um, and I think in order to sort of make the process um, or rather break down the power differential, I feel like so much of what the mental health practitioner stands for and the stance they are taking uh, towards mental health care is, is a crucial factor. I think when we're talking about collaboration and a stance on collaborative therapy, uh, you know, it, it's also about uh, are we making the space of therapy uh, safe enough for the person to bring up um, you know, some concerns about therapy not going well? Uh, are we able to make a space for the client to give us feedback on, uh, you know, what's working, what's not working? Um, are we also able to look at therapy and mental health care from the perspective of the rights of the client or for the person who's seeking therapy that they do have the right to you know ask for information from the therapist they do have the right to change the therapist if it's not working out for them um, you know they do have the right to uh, seek other forms of mental health care if therapy isn't working out so I think rights-based approach to the whole mental health care system is so um, crucial and important uh, another thing that is also coming to mind is uh, that can in a way reconstruct some of the power differential is um, a, a sort of an alignment between the person and the professional. And by that, I mean uh, access to the person behind the professional, so to speak, because I feel like a lot of power gets held, uh, you know, in the therapist's hand when all that they reveal about themselves is very professional information. Like everywhere around us, if you are trying to find a therapist around you, all you will see is, you know, listicles of 
say their professional information like their location their fees um you know uh the qualifications etc which are of course really important pieces of information but therapy at the end of the day is a very uh, intimate personal uh, you know process of healing and i think uh, as clients as users of therapy we have the right to also um, find resonance with our therapist and i feel like the resonance comes only when we're able to see the person behind the professional and by that i mean if we're able to have access to what are some of their values what are or some of the things that they stand for what is the kind of therapy they practice um you know what is their understanding of mental health where do they situate problems right what brought them into this journey so having more access to information like that i think also helps to break down the power differential which is also something we try to do on the mind clan so the professionals that we list online um have like this get to know section for every counselor so that you're able to get a peek into some of the things that they stand for and their values so i feel like that's maybe another way we can rethink the system um and again to reiterate uh, you know a really important point that i think therapists cannot have a neutral a political stance when it comes to approaching mental health care uh, like i'm i'm actually remembering uh, the words of uh, this woman her name is america braco and she runs uh, something called the latino health access and i got an opportunity to listen to her speech at a conference recently and she uh, she she says these words she says that we are responsible for the stories that we hear and i felt like that was so powerful because you know as practitioners i feel like we have an accountability to the kind of stories that we are listening into and the kind of conversations we are willing to have in that therapy room because if we are not acknowledging that uh, you know marginalization exists if we are not acknowledging that uh, you know injustice systemic injustice exists then all those conversations remain outside the therapy room and that isn't really helpful uh, for the person at all so i think uh, to kind of have that sort of stance and also in a way to to transform that stance into action right uh, like just today i was seeing a post by this uh, disability activist her name is mia mingus and uh, they write about uh, how solidarity is a verb and it's not i mean of course it's a stance but i think it's so important to think of ways to translate that stance into action which could you know look like uh, like i mentioned listening into the community wisdom uh, you know passing the mic instead of speaking on behalf of them and really believing that uh, people are experts of their own lives and they have the resources that they have the knowledge to um you know uh, figure out ways to cope which they have been doing historically and i think we uh, need to sort of listen into that and uh, learn from it uh, so by sort of making them the center of knowledge producers if that makes sense yeah thank you so much for bringing in um the entire social justice human rights based approach uh, conversation also here which actually uh, takes me to the next question that uh, we have for dr bargavi the first question to you would be what should be the right entry point into people's experience of experiences of psychosocial issues is there an alternative entry point to the one that currently exists um i'd like to begin by you know um saying thanks to the number of people uh, today in india particularly the young uh, coming from different class caste backgrounds uh, sexual orientation uh, all of that to share their experiences uh, with the mental health system and also it's very uh, liberating to know about new mental health approaches uh, which uh, in which veta talked about and sure that several others spoke about uh, today um very culturally grounded you know uh, not 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 too much into diagnostics um and uh, really uh, attentive to people's narratives uh, of their lived lives of discrimination of stigma you know of exclusion all of that so really grateful for that i also like because there are, i know that there's a audience out there there's also a very nice book it's the first of its kind i believe in india uh it's called uh, side effects of living uh and it's by jilmel breckenridge um uh, she uh, writes uh, prolifically you know gathering voices of people who've been through the mental health system and who've been through 
psychosocial stress, distress, disturbance, and disabilities. Um, really uh, also uses poetry as a therapeutic means, uh, creative expression as ther therapeutic means. And so, uh, you know, you could also look up her work. Um, so uh, from, I, I'm sorry that I did not attend a lot of the sessions. Um, uh, it's a bit irresponsible of me, but going by the last uh, few uh, hours, uh, one of the streams of thought I'm hearing is that we are asking for a better, more evolved, progressive mental health system. So are we asking for better pills? Are we asking for better diagnostic systems? Are we asking for better psychiatry? Uh, maybe non-discriminating, progressive, politically correct psychiatrists. Uh, is this what we are asking? You know, I remember my early writings way back in 1990s uh, when I did that. Um, I did say that there is a lot of gender discrimination. Uh, at that point, uh, uh, the lesbian movement was not very was not very visible uh, in these debates, but the Dalit movement definitely was. Um, and so was the women's movement. Uh, at that point, uh, until very recently, we were involved also in, in research some a, a few years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, uh, trying to figure out from the Dalit communities where we work, we work in low income bastis of Pune city. Uh, so we uh, went around asking some Dalit communities, uh, really 50% of our uh, of our catchment area, so to speak, are Dalit. Um, and then they told us, uh, you know, we don't want mental health services. What we want is jobs, steady jobs. We don't want to go into debt. Uh, we don't want people to, you know, kind of harass us because of our caste uh, backgrounds. Uh, and they were very adamant to refuse mental health services. This also happened with another sex worker group and a transgender group. They all consist. So as a mental health agency, what are we supposed to do? You know, we're supposed to provide mental health services, but people are saying, give us social justice. You know, don't give us mental health. That's not what we need. We're suicidal because of social injustice. You know, we're depressed because of that. And that is the root problem. So don't give us this. Um, and uh, perhaps, you know, I don't think so. I heard a lot about poverty uh, in the discussions. Maybe I missed something, but our, our work is largely with the urban poor. Um, and uh, we started out as a traditional mental health service, offering counseling services and all of that. Slowly, the canvas expanded, uh, you know, slowly the canvas expanded to basically social justice intervention. So my provocative question, uh, you know, is uh, supposing a program or an entity where to deliver just social justice solutions to communities, will that result in better mental health? Um, and uh, that's been the question that Bapu Trust has been like really exploring uh, in the last decade after the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities came into the, you know, the policy scenario. Uh, it is, of course, a United Nations Convention on a par with CEDAW, CRC, and other such treatises. Very much the Indian government is committed to this. Um, it is a rights-based document, of course, um, and it is talking about uh, not just mental health care right, definitely no. I mean, it's talking about all kinds of rights, uh, the spectrum is, the canvas is pretty large. Um, and how does a mental health agency deal with that? Um, so that has been our uh, question, uh, you know, that, that we've been trying to answer. And we did create some new innovative programs. Um, yeah, so we have to be careful what we wish for. You know, if you're asking for better psychiatry, psychiatry is a product of colonialism and war times. You know, it's what they call an old model. I mean, we don't we don't usually keep car models which are like a hundred years old. Can we really expect? You know, the institutions were born of colonialism. The practices of segregation, seclusion, exclusion are born of colonialism, and you will find it in every psychiatric clinic. 
uh, it is those practices which result in the discrimination. They're not bad people, but they have a colonial frame and they can't shake it off. And so this is something that really to consider, you know, can we really expect such a discipline to bring us what we need? Uh, if that seems a bit of a stretch, you know, just talking about like mental health services, you know, like going out and buying vegetables and why do you talk about colonialism? If that seems like a bit of a stretch, uh, then I just say that psychiatry at its best is a statistical discipline till today with all the different diagnoses, and already Shweta has talked about the problems of the diagnosis. It does not have anatomical, physiological, or any other kind of biological markers to bolster its narrative of uh, something being a mental disease. You know? Like Corona, how long did it take the scientists to you know, give a shape and a feature to the bug? To know where it is going in the human body? How long does it take to, you know, to to take out the oxygen in the lungs. How long did the scientists take to figure this out? Barely any time. You've got like, I don't know, 100 years of psychiatric diagnosis starting from DSM-1 to DSM-5. You still got nothing. You still got nothing. So this is something to really think about. Uh, do read Robert Whittaker's Forceful Critique of Psychiatry and the Chemical Imbalance Theory. The first indicator, in my view, of a bad psychiatrist in India is if he or she will tell you that you're suffering from a chemical imbalance. They do it all the time. They do it all the time. Yeah, so what is the entry point? Um, you know, the, the other curiosity is that, you know, I, I have a lot of friends who have been through mental health issues, um, psychosocial disabilities, and, uh, and sometimes we kind of have discussions as, as peers, you know, what's going on. Uh, and one of the discoveries we made is the only people we talk to are our therapists and our psychiatrists. What is that? What kind of life is that? Um, I mean, you know, what about football or embroidery or, you know, uh, my family members, they're all part of this, uh, this queen club of crochet, you know. That's an amazing support group. Um, but why is it that we don't get into that? Who's telling us not to? I mean, is there a whisper in, that we hear in these clinics that, you know, guys just stay home and just talk to me? Is there something like that going on? Um, so I wonder, you know, because literally, I mean, many, I've spoken to many people and only people we are talking to are among ourselves and with our doctor and with the therapist. Maximum, probably the pharmacist, you see? And so this needs to change. Uh, we need to look at social support systems, uh, you know. And so in Bapu Trust, we do a lot of human rights work on the rights of persons with psychosocial stress, distress, disturb disturbance, and disability. And uh, these days, you know, I make it a habit to spell out all these distress, distress, disturbance, and disability. I will not say mental illness. Uh, so we are working in the Asia Pacific region. And what we see really are poverty, gender equality, violence against ethnic and indigenous groups uh, all over the region. And our work involves asking for those to be corrected, for example, with social protection schemes. We join hands with the women's movement, ask for zero violence. We have members from the Dalit community in India, indigenous communities in Indonesia, LGBTQI communities from Thai Taiwan, and so on. Mental health today is intersectional in a way that was never the case before. And we ask for social justice. And social justice, we do believe, you know, part of political movements, social justice will improve mental health. Um, and for that part, you know, for example, we do this self-preservation um, clinics or self-preservation workshops using arts-based therapy. Uh, um, Bapu Trust offers also a year-long arts-based therapy course, which is a great uh, peer support um, for persons with disabilities, particularly persons with mental health issues and psychosocial disabilities. Um, and uh, so, um, um, you know, so the, I'm not saying that the experience of distress, disturbance and disability is not there. What I'm contesting is that it comes anywhere close to an illness. So, and if you have distress, disturbance and disability, 
there are an infinite number of healing methods to deal with that. And uh, it's all available. I mean, just do a Google and many of them are available today. So in the Bapu Trust, we talk about entry points. There are three doors. There is the rather tiny mental health door. Then there is the bigger development door. And there is a huge human rights door. Um, mental health is the smallest possible door. And often, often if, it, if you enter that door, it leads to a dead end, particularly in Commonwealth nations like India, which are so colonial in their approach to mental health. We still reek of unsound mind. Uh, you'll find it in the laws, you know, uh, Amitaji is going to talk after me. So it's going to be, it's going, it'll be found in the laws. You'll find, find it, you'll find it in the practices. You'll find it in the institutions. You'll find it in the communities. Um, and uh, the development door is bigger. It offers a chance at life by accessing schemes and entitlements. The human rights door is the largest door. And using door two and door three, we can cover nearly all that a person may need in their lives, including, if need be, comprehensive health care. So if people, you know, I remember this woman who, uh, who was terrified of catching the HIV uh, bug because her brother died of HIV and she was a primary caregiver and uh, you know, her house was a mess because it was floating in water and she was completely scratched over with all kinds of detergents and soaps and everything. So then we offered her all kinds of therapies, so to speak, I mean, counseling and breathing practice and arts based and this and that. And, and she said, guys, I don't know what you're doing with me. This poor woman. Uh, she had stopped working, could not afford to do that. Uh, and she said, just take me to a psychiatrist and get me some medicines. I'll be perfectly fine. And so that's what we did and it worked for her. I mean, uh, so um, each to their own. Um, let there not be a single narrative and social justice uh, needs to be prescribed more and human rights needs to be universal for all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we actually thank you so much for speaking uh, about something so important. Uh, we actually have a, uh, you, I think you already covered a bit of the previous, uh, the next question in your previous answer. Uh, but uh, we'd actually uh, ask you uh, if you could touch upon any policy and program designs that can be incorporated, um, uh, that can be incorporated in the mental health system currently. Yes, yeah, so um, policies, right now we have the Mental Health Care Act, which is a, again a post-colonial legislation, which is meant for forcibly incarcerating people uh, with disabilities inside mental institutions. Um, and of course, our first policy recommendation is very serious deinstitutionalization in all Commonwealth countries in Asia Pacific, but specifically in India. Uh, so deinstitutional, I think the government is also starting to do something, but as long as the Mental Health Care Act is in the, in the country, that's uh, deinstitutionalization is going to be impossible. Um, and uh, so, um, so there is that, you start with that. Um, in many countries, you know, they don't have mental health laws and they also don't have these custodial institutions you know, because they were never colonized by the British. The British left us this peculiar legacy of... Uh, of delivering care by withdrawing justice. You know, you, you say that you're giving a treatment, but you take away all the rights. Uh, and uh, I say that uh, so-called unsound mind people are the only ones uh, who pay to get arrested in our country. Um, and so that's because of the, you know, of the fallacies uh, and the illusions left by the Mental Health Care Act. So that has to go, we have to find full inclusion in the disability laws, schemes and policies all over at the state level, at the central level. Um, there, is a, uh, there is a plan called the DMHP, that's a district mental health program, but it's largely a drug dispensing setup. It has to be much more comprehensive in terms of, like I said, opening all three doors, not just the mental health or the medicine door. Um, a lot more of community folks need to be involved uh, in, in, that, uh, in that plan. It was done with only the consultation of psychiatrists. So community participation in making plans and policies, that's so important. A lot of us who are practicing, like I'm an art space therapist, there are clinical psychologists, there are you know, all kinds of therapists, psychoanalysts. As far as the government is concerned, all of us are uh, quacks. There's no proper registration procedure. 
uh, and uh, we don't find our any mention of us in the in any kind of law so we are all on the same book we are all quacks it really de um, de recognizes um, a lot of us who are in the healing professions uh, psychology is such a foundational mental health science but it finds nowhere you will find that you know it's it's in practice so these are some of the things that i'm sure that there are lots more i mean think about policy but deinstitutionalization and allowing for uh, community support systems to come in through the disability legislation it's already there but i don't know you know when if you are a person with a psychosocial disability usually you get pushed into the health system and then the mental hospital very rarely people will say that hey you are a person with a psychosocial disability now let me give you a disability card and you are entitled to all the disability benefits very rarely this happens so i doubt if any psychiatrist ever tells anyone that you are a person with a disability why are you coming here you should go to the disability support system services i doubt very much so that system that paradigm shift has to happen thank you thank you so much uh, dr bhargavi uh, that was extremely uh, in, in useful insightful and uh, we're glad that you brought those points up and um, that actually uh, takes us to uh, professor danda next uh, uh, yes yeah. my first question to you would be how is the dominant discourse on mental health hardwired by the law when well, if i was to just take off from where bhargavi left off and when she spoke in terms of that uh if you want the various kinds of uh, let me take that one point which uh, shweta was making where she spoke in terms of you know even if you have a diagnosis you give voice to what the person who's diagnosed thinks about it and that person's voice and what they think they need uh needs to be the you know the uh like say needs to be the take off point for any kind of intervention in mental health that's that's the it's come in different kinds of ways when a lot of us talking in terms of uh, you know the entire problems around pms and you know the, the the sort of difficulties that people are faced up with but which you don't hear because according to you that doesn't qualify within whatever it is your categorization law gets the the thing somewhere is what each one is speaking about is a dominant way of looking at things and in the dominant way of looking at things the moment you are starting to say even if i was to take bhargavi's categorization of stress distress you know uh, i think what was the third one uh, disability and disturbance and disability hmm? that's what she was even if you were to take that entire kind of continuum it's like the moment you step in there somewhere amongst the things that laws looks at is if you are in that stress stress distress disturbance disability then you are also somebody who really cannot be controlling your own life so the first thing which goes away from you is your autonomy your voice what you want and each of the interventions which have happened before me are speaking about that if you hear the person whether it is social justice they want or the psychiatrist whether it is a uh, you know like the the kind of uh, the, it's not like people do not require or do not sometimes find useful a drug intervention but it's like to speak in terms of a compulsory drug intervention and to make the drug intervention as one of the choices there's a world of difference between the two when when i say that you know it's what you need to be looking at even at the recent law which is coming post the crpd uh it's supposed to be a modern looking legislation but how does it really conceptualize a person uh who is in distress so amongst the first kinds of things that you believe in is you say okay you can have an advanced director okay you can have a personal representative okay you can have but it's like every one of the things that you are asking for or you are saying would be a medium through which your voice can be articulated can at any point of time be taken away from you if pe- other people believe that the manner in which you are thinking or what you are asking or demanding or what you say will result in your well being is not how they see it and unless and until this hardwiring changes all the other interventions 
keep getting categorized as alternative mental health, as another way of doing things, something which is possible uh, in your small community, in your particular organization. One can feel good about the fact that you are making these experiments and I'm not in any way trying to downsize the importance of discipline. And in fact, the very fact that so many of them are happening at this point of time seems to be that some knocking at the door is happening. But if simultaneous you look at all the meta level discourse, you look at the kind of structures that you're creating, you look at the Mental Health Care Act of 17, what is it saying? Its entire way of giving good mental health services is only about the fact that if there is a drug that you require and that drug is not available in your particular, you know, primary health care facility or elsewhere, or any public health care facility, you go buy it for yourself and get a reimbursement. It is speaking in terms of that, okay, rights is about the fact that you should also be having an ambulance coming to your house and taking you away. It's not about the fact that, okay, let's hear this person. What does he or she want? And it's that connection, Lassia, which is important to make. And see, I don't have any illusions that the law is going to be kind of making for this great uh, emancipation. I'm not talking about the law as the medium of emancipation, but I'm definitely saying that everybody who's engaged with emancipation needs to be looking at how the law is amongst the major impediments. Even human rights, when it is spoken about, because Bhargavi spoke about human rights being the biggest door. Human rights is the biggest door, but is that biggest door coming for people with psychosocial disability, with all these sort of, uh, you know, uh, let's say, all the paraphernalia which human rights discourse as such has for every other excluded community that you can be speaking truth to power, you can be saying that what I have to say, I am giving you the story of my oppression. And if my story of my oppression is then retranslated into the story of my delusion, then the, the, the larger system has in effect silenced me even before I have started to speak. So I suppose the challenge for us, Lasya, would be that yeah, these two things are happening simultaneously. Is there some way in which one can be used to undercut the one which we feel is the impediment? The positive developments, can they be used to undercut the, the impediments? Okay. Uh, I, I think you already covered some of the points that uh, were there. For Your the second, second question was going to ask. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, since we spoke about emancipation and law, right, I would just like actually take the second part of my second question and pose it to you. Uh, how big an obstacle is it to change the mental health structures? Uh, how big is law an obstacle to change the mental health structures that exist currently? Well, I think somewhere in the discussion in this panel, we were speaking in terms of power. And we were speaking in terms of like how very unwilling are people who are occupying positions of power to give it up. So what we need to be looking at when you pick up a legislation in law, you know, it is, it is like it, rec it recognizes psychiatry. It recognizes one set of mental health sciences. It recognizes to some extent lawyers and judges. And they all believe that they know. They believe that they're understanding. So this point about look at the person behind the professional which uh, Shweta was making, it's, it's not an acknowledgement. They're all only professionals. And such objective, neutral professionals. So whatever their personal dilemmas or their personal travails might be, they have overcome them to be still those objective, neutral professionals. So unless and until there's an acknowledgement of your own vulnerability, where is the question of your wanting to in any... And that, see, the point that uh, Lassia is this, that... If that acknowledgement of vulnerability comes, then evidently they would also assist in some manner you know, in dismantling these institutions. But if that's not the case, if they believe that every set of people who are setting up these alternative initiatives or trying to give voice to persons with psychosocial disability or persons in stress, distress, disturbance, disability, whatever, your the entire continuum, if you believe that all of those are misguided people, 
And okay, maybe in some exceptional case, case, you might have been able to do what you're doing. But if we were to, you know, like what is it called, unleash it on the society at large, we would only have dangerous people and a whole range of discord and, you know, chaos. So that kind of uh, fear that you are all the time able to gets everyone else to step back and say, maybe this is something we don't really know about. As it is, a mental illness or you know, any sort of uh, mental distress is generally believed as something which happens to the other person. And uh, uh, I would, listen, I really don't know very much about it. Why don't we refer this person to this, that, or the other? And unless and until we see these distress situations in our everyday life, and start to then think of, okay, what I would say as an administrator in a university or as a professor there, how do I address my students' distress? We're having a lot of this as a part of the pandemic. You know, it's like, okay, suddenly life has gone for a six for these students. They don't know. How do we teach them? How do we evaluate them? What should we do or not do? Now, all of them for me are everyday questions of distress and could help if you are going to be saying that, okay, don't worry about it. you do your exam when you can do it. Is it a pro mental health measure or not? Or if we say we have to have online teaching and then we also insist that we're going to give you attendance, necessarily that causes stress to rise and fall. I'm just saying this to you, Lasya, that this is a question that everybody has to be raising. And it's only when it becomes everybody's question and not something special that a judge or a psychiatrist or some other mental health professional has to decide upon, then we can start to talk about inclusive mental health. Yeah, thank you for saying that uh, this has to become everybody's question. Absolutely. I think that is the agenda setting that we need to do. Uh, the, I, I, that's also actually something uh, that answers the last question that I have. Um, in a way, is that are there any models to address the challenges in the field? Um, and how can we go forward? One is, yes, it has to become everybody's question um, to maybe break it down. Are there any uh, specific models uh, to address the existing challenges and how can we overcome? Is the question to me? Yes. I would sometimes say that um, to take off from what I gave you as my one solution that I genuinely do think that it's, it's about life and it's about everybody's life and it's about our life struggles. Whether we want to speak about this as a social justice issue or whether we want to speak it as just about the effect of accepting human diversity, the large range of human diversity and allowing people to be. Do not believe that there's some preordained model within which everybody has to be, you know, like stuffed in and then expected to somehow live through. The other thing I would somewhere believe that at least if there is in step back, a step back by all people in positions of authority and start to be asking that what is the, what is the legitimacy of your authority? I'm, I'm literally asking for reflection. I'm saying that, okay, I ask. Is it only because you're occupying a specific position that whatever you do and say is necessarily just and right? Or, or is there another way of doing things? So is a more participative, uh, less, author less authoritative way of doing things where we are dialoguing with each other rather than issuing fiats and say, you do this and that. How much of dialogue do we have, even in the smallest, between parents and children, between teacher and student? You know, you pick up the microsystem relationships and start asking, can you really turn around and ask your boss, but why should I do this? Or is it that he says, do this, and you just have to do it, and just, just a yes or a no, you know, is the only answer. Because you can't really say no, so it's a literally a yes, ma'am, or a yes, sir kind of a response that is required. I am, I would, because of the fact that at least uh, 
I mean, Bhargavi also has kind of, she's done uh, mega level projects also, but she's done a lot of uh, micro studies and looked at people more close home and seeing what they're doing. What Shweta was narrating and what Laura was saying, each of these are in effect, you know, uh, I'm not saying small in the, in the sense of, but it's like they are interventions of particular individuals who are starting to question things again. I am just saying is that don't make that question, let, let that question happen at both the micro level and the macro level, because unless both are happening, and the micro level examples then become a reason for advocating a change at the macro level. That's what we need. There's a, there needs to be a dialogue. And it's, it's like, you know, someone like me who'd be sitting there and talking in terms of the Mental Health Care Act or about the Convention on Rights of People with Disabilities or how law as such treats people, uh, you know, who are supposed to be incompetent. And then what are or whatever cases come to court and stuff so it's all at a very big level but the smaller kind of examples the everyday kinds of examples where where people got the requisite support and were able to manage or did not get it and fell by the wayside what's the connection between this meta and the micro for me that's extremely important all right and it needs to be very very dominantly asked on a constant basis Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, uh, for, for uh, shedding light on that. We actually uh, are out of time. So there are three <laughs> questions. Yeah, uh, as usual, there are three questions uh, uh, that have come in and I will pose it to uh, who I think they're meant for. Like, I think uh, each of these questions are directed at uh, one or the other panelists. Uh, the first question is from Agastya and I think... Uh, Shweta, this came in when you were speaking earlier or uh, at the beginning of the session. So if you could just unmute yourself. Uh, so uh, Agastya asked, yeah. don't you think that the family system context needs to be addressed and the family caregivers given support besides the medicating approach? Uh, we are missing out on supporting the family to come to terms fully by being an active, by playing an active role in the recovery and human rehabilitation and not uh, just partially as acceptance. Um, so I think uh, uh, Agastya is speaking about involving family, which is a point that came about in the work board session that we did earlier as well. So, yeah. Right, right. Absolutely. So I think to answer that, I think it's an absolute necessity to also include some of the um, support systems that a uh, person uh, you know, is in, which may include their family, which may include the chosen family. Uh, and I think uh, I can also speak experience. Uh, as I, I am a caregiver myself of a very close family member who experiences a mental health condition. And uh, I think our family a lot of time to, like uh, Agastya mentioned, not just accept, but also the space of uh, really sort of coming to terms with this as a family as well. As a family, also we kind of took time to move from acceptance, but also uh, towards more uh, understanding of you know supporting our family member and how that can be possible, uh, you know, in a more holistic fashion, and also kind of recognizing the ways in which this person is already doing things to respond to uh, you know the, the the mental health condition that they're living with. So um, I definitely think that's important to involve the support system of the individual. Yeah. And also maybe just adding uh, to that, the fact that uh, uh, our mental health conditions or the trauma are a result of our environment and they could also be a result of the family that we are living with, right? So maybe healing process Absolutely. also involves healing the entire family or the entire community together. Uh, so it might not just be about acceptance and support, but it should also be about maybe sometimes if your family is itself your oppressor, heal the entire family together or address the generational conditioning together, which is when we could probably move forward uh, more holistically. Uh, the next question is to Laura. Uh, Laura, very quickly, if you can unmute. Uh, yeah. Uh, Laura, Anisha asks, what do you think about all these alternative Facebook groups that put together some information uh, for supporting women's health problems uh, and charge a lot and try to provide support, but not have, uh, but have very unscientific methods uh, are you aware of something like that or uh, could do you have any anything to say about that yeah um, yeah I am aware of a few and they're becoming 
more and more uh, frequent as um, awareness of PMDD grows. Um, I can only comment, not from an organisational point of view, but from a personal point of view, that um, it's very difficult when people are desperate for help and they're not getting the help they need through the right routes through healthcare professionals. And I can understand the, um, the desperation people have. Um, we work very hard as an organisation to be evidence-based and try and provide um, clear routes for people to get whatever help, treatment help they, they require. Um, it's a really difficult one to comment on. People, people will do what they feel better. I feel very sad for, for people that perhaps are taken advantage of, but um, it would be really difficult to comment on it on a sort of a, a blanket case, I'm afraid. But um, I, I can understand people's desperation why they turn that way if they're not getting the help they need through the healthcare service. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Uh I think that also brings us back to the systematic problem that we've been discussing. Yes. Very yeah, very time. much so. Yeah. Uh, so the next question, actually, I think either Bhargavi or uh, Professor Danda could take or um, take. Uh, this is in a very Indian context. Um, what do you think would inspire more funding to study women's health and how can we bring more legislature to support this? While we have so many movies invested to give insight on what women want, not many thought leaders invested in supporting actual research and documentation. Uh, Bhargavi or Professor Danda, either of you, if you have anything to uh, add to this. Amita ji. Bhargavi funding, it's yours. <laughs> <laughs> For India, research funding is really, really difficult. So. Um, anyway, um, that's, that's, that's the universal aspect of funding. Um, funding for research is non-existent. Um, there are multinational collaborations, uh, you know, on gender and mental health, but they tend to be more medical in nature. Uh, Community-based research uh, is, is, really, um, is really so difficult to do. Um, but suppose there is like a million dollars for research on you know, on women's health, um, and including all the perspectives that you know, that we've heard today. Then, what kind of research needs to be uh, needs to be? What would be good research questions? So I think this is a very important uh, one. Um, you know, we can like I've read a lot of papers um, in my working life, um, and they all begin with, uh, you know. This is the you know percentage of people suffering from mental illness, and there are so many psychiatric beds, and there are so many uh, psychiatrists in the country, and there are no psychologists. So oh, nearly all of them begin in this way. It's a it's a it's a, again a very medical entry point into the discussion where social justice uh, issues or social determinants, uh, what causes people uh, to feel distress, um, that is not explored at all particularly in the context of women's issues. I've read tons of paper where, uh, you know, people are talking about hormonal changes causing depression, you know, then, uh, in fact, there are papers which say that things like lower back pain, uh, vaginal discharge, uh, chronic fatigue, these have nothing to do with real medical problems or, you know, health issues for women, but they actually have to do with, uh, uh, undiagnosed depression. There are many, many, like dozens of papers like this. Uh, and add on to this the fact that a lot of mental health funding today is by pharmaceuticals. And the picture is complete. Why are we having research in this way? Uh, and what is this? And of course, now open access. So whatever you research, you can publish it if you have the money. You know. So it is a really, uh, really uh, disturbing trend in research to find really authentic ways of, uh, you know, reaching out to women's experiences. Um, you know, what does it mean for somebody? And I think that today's morning I, I sat in for a while and uh, the sharing that came from people's lived experiences, there is no, not even an archive of that, for example, in India, uh, you know, something like that uh, would be really, really useful. Can we go very deep into person's uh, uh, 
experiences of uh, distress, disturbance, and disability, and try to understand, you know, uh, how far we can go um, into that, uh, and uh, how many layers of environmental factors, which you've been talking about, Lasya, can we can we you know get out of that? Yeah. So, I just wanted to add a sentence to what Bhargavi is saying. That maybe, like, and this is only a maybe, and possibly because of my own location that I'm putting this maybe there. One, one space which could be explored is still uh, the, the university space, the kinds of things that, uh, you know, people are starting to do in terms of research being guided from a disability studies perspective, where you are encouraging or helping people to ask different kind of questions. The reason why, I mean, when Bhargavi is talking in terms of the sort of papers that you're reading, it's because the system pushes you more towards doing that kind of thing. So that's a possibility and maybe a slight ray of hope. But I think it's, it's something worth exploring because you do find that at least in uh, an effort of wanting to have a conversation from a different way is possible. I'm not saying it's happening, but it's like wherein you are not looking for big funding, but you're starting to sort of somewhere funnel your concern into ac existing academic channels. You know, and some of that we've been doing at Nalsar and like, you know, we've been trying to encourage those kinds of conversations. So it might be worthwhile to look at uh, good educational research spaces wherein different kind of conversation is possible. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, 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 Professor Danda, for that, and also Dr. Bhargavi. Um, I think we are out of time, and uh, we have we could we ad we answered all the questions that we could. Uh, Anisha, I think, has another question. I'm not sure we have enough time for that, but if any of the panelists would want to take it, uh, you could just type the answer out. Um, and I would uh, I would like to at this stage uh, thank uh, each one of the panelists here, Professor Danda, uh, Shweta. Uh, uh, Dr. Bhargavi and Laura for joining us today and actually wrapping up this conversation and this day long conversation on inclusive mental health uh, in the best way possible. And uh, we will uh, thank you so much each one of you to, for taking the time out and uh, bringing your perspective to the table. Uh, this will really help us in building the Belong Mental Health Collective and also I'm sure it will really help everybody who's listening in. Um, we, uh, to all the attendees who've been asking, we will be uh, publishing the videos of the entire day uh, in different segments uh, on our YouTube channel, House of Belong, in the week, uh, in the next week or two. Uh, so you can watch our channel or you can watch our social media uh, to follow up. We'll also be uh, uh, bringing out some written content uh, that's coming out of these sessions. Uh, so that will also be made available in the coming weeks. And uh, we'll also, as Pallavi asked in the morning, try to make it more inclusive uh, and uh, accessible to people uh, uh, with different disabilities as well. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for pointing out and asking for all these things. And thank you to all the attendees who've uh, been around since the morning uh, since, uh, and uh, stuck with us through the conversation that we were uh, having throughout. Um, uh, we really hope you enjoyed uh, the conversations here. If any of the panelists are comfortable with it and would uh, want to take the audience's questions, you can leave your uh, email IDs or Twitter handles, etc. in the chat box um, before we sign off. And uh, the, the last thing, uh, besides thanking all the audience uh, and the panelists for the entire day, uh, I'd also like to uh, take a minute to thank uh, the Belongs team. Um, every single person who has uh, worked so hard, uh, Sanjana, Jean, uh, uh, Manjari, Shranya, Jay, um, and Neerat, I think, would like to give the concluding remarks. Neerat, if you could just uh, come and say a few words. Uh, th thanks, Lars. I, I just want to sort of thank all the panelists uh, for your thoughts and all the people uh, uh, for being here. Uh, just to maybe share a little bit of light on where we see this heading. So through these conversations over the last few weeks and months, what's becoming clear is that uh, intersectionality of mental health with uh, 
uh, with identity is really, really important. Uh, and you will see some announcements uh, uh, that we'll be making uh, around some toolkits for training, uh, perhaps even a fellowship program around mental health and identity. And obviously, we, we're very keen on partnering with organizations who are working uh, in, in the space. So if you uh, would like to sort of uh, explore collaboration opportunities, do drop us a note. Uh, uh, last year, Sanjana or uh, or I or anyone else, frankly, in the Belong team, we'd be very, very keen on exploring partnerships. Uh, we're also doing, a, uh, we're trying to put in place a bunch of research partnerships or, uh, as well at the intersection of mental health and research uh, with global uh, institutes uh, that have uh, this focus area. So we uh, do stay tuned uh, for that. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, just want to say thanks again and have a great uh, rest of the weekend. Uh, and, and, and thanks, Lasse, for anchoring this and thanks to the Belong team. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye for now.